What's happening, Dodger fans? Thank you for listening to another episode of the Incline Dodgers podcast. The MLB is in full lockdown, but we have a number of exciting topics, and we're going to do the inaugural Incline Dodgers award show later in this episode. But we have a number of topics to cover, like I just said. And let's start with Chris Taylor agreeing and signing to come back to the Los Angeles Dodgers on a four-year, $60 million deal. A fifth-year team option is in there with a $4 million buyout. That means $64 million is guaranteed to Chris Taylor. David Rosenthal, let me welcome you in. What are your thoughts on the Dodgers reuniting with CT3? This was a necessity for the Dodgers. Uh, After losing Corey Seager, uh, the bench being super thin last year, they needed to bring Chris Taylor back. And man, what a team-friendly deal this was. Uh, it was reported that he wanted to stay in LA the whole time. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind he had a, he had an offer, mo- probably multiple offers for for significantly more money, uh, and he wanted to stay home. Simple man like surfing and beer. That's about all he needs in life, uh, and that benefited the Dodgers tremendously. Uh, I mean, I, I still can't get over what a team friendly deal this is, especially with the team option in the fifth year. Phenomenal job from Friedman and, and Chris Taylor. And frankly, I think his, his girlfriend needs an assist here uh, because I think she is uh, probably a, a factor in this decision too. It's kind of funny because five years ago, Kenley Jansen was at a wedding. Was it his own wedding? Regardless, he had a few Dodgers teammates. He had an offer on the table from the Marlins and the Nationals, and he ended up yeah. choosing the Dodgers. And this is almost a similar scenario. Uh, my analysis on the Taylor contract, he ultimately got what he was deserving, deserved. You know, the speculation was he was going to get something close to what Ben Zobris got uh, a number of years ago. And Zobris was 36 when he got that deal. Taylor's 31. Jake Reiner, I know you were big on bringing back Taylor. So what is your gut telling you of this deal? Oh, this was huge. And I was totally on board with, with bringing back CT3. I thought that um, the Dodgers probably got together and thought, that basically they needed to bring him back because you saw what happened last year. We've talked about it, losing Kike, losing Jock. I mean, these uh, role player, uh, big piece, big piece uh, of this franchise, like Taylor, they're, they're not easy to come by. And so when you have a guy this valuable who has provided not only versatility on the field, but also the clutch hitting that he provided as recently as this past playoffs. I mean, you know, he got us into the divisional round with that walk-off home run that Kevin and I were in attendance for. And then uh, you fast forward to the NLCS and he, you know, helped keep the Dodgers hopes alive and sending it to a game six back uh, in Atlanta by hitting three home runs. I mean, he, uh, he the, the uh, amount that he has brought to this team is, is kind of priceless, but David mentioned it. It is a very, team friendly deal, but I also think it's a fair deal. I mean, the fact that he got four years, 60 million, like that is basically uh, a fair trade for both sides. That's the, that's the talent he provides. He's not a, you know, a franchise cornerstone, but he gets paid enough to basically provide what he provides. And I, I couldn't be more happy for him. And I also think it's worth pointing out that, even though we like the fact that he wanted to stay with the Dodgers, I don't think any of us are going to be knocking any player for trying to find greener pastures elsewhere. It's all about, you know, getting the most money for, you know, as, as much as you can, because you don't know when, uh, when your career might be done, you don't know when, you know, how long you're going to last in this league. So getting as much money as possible is definitely the name of the game. Corey Seager did that. I don't knock him for doing that. Um, but I also think it's pretty cool that Chris Taylor did want to stay and told other teams that it was more about staying with the Dodgers than it was about getting more money. Yeah. Down discount. Don't be surprised if you I, see a certain left-handed pitcher do the same thing. Danny so, Duffy. You're right, David. <laughs> <laughs> so ju- just to put it in perspective, Justin Turner, when he resigned with the Dodgers, not this previous off season, but the big one for him, he signed with the Dodgers for a four year, $64 million deal. So Like Jake said, I think this contract is right on the nose for what Taylor deserved. And honestly, I think the scope of things changed after Seager left the Dodgers officially in free agency, because if the Dodgers were to bring Seager back, I don't think Taylor comes back on that same deal. I think he chases probably the money because he's less likely to get a role, which is going to be something more interesting when we head into the 2022 season, because even without Taylor in the lineup, we still had eight guys to field. Now with Taylor in there, 
you're going to have to kind of mix and match where Pollock goes, where Lux goes. Obviously, everyone else is a guaranteed starter, but, you know, things can change if Max Muncy does miss some time. Then that will obviously open it up for Taylor. But there are some rumors we are going to talk about in a little bit, which could definitely change the magnitude of this Dodgers lineup. Yeah, I just I just want to reiterate how I really think this was a necessity um, because, yes, they had eight starters before Chris Taylor returned. But just look what happened last year. I, I mean, the team basically collapsed in terms of injuries, uh, one after the other, uh, offensively, defensively, pitching wise, everything. So I, I really think Taylor was a necessity here. He's proven he can stay healthy over his career. And, and yeah, it was a fair deal for both sides, but I can guarantee you fate of the universe on the line that he had a higher offer from at least two other teams. Oh, yeah. definitely. Probably higher, but I want to, I'm curious to what they were because I love when things like that leak kind of. Also, I just want to add this. He wants to win. I think that that is, is, we can't underestimate a player's will to win and be on a championship caliber team. Who knows where those other offers came from, but the Dodgers give any player out there. I don't care. I don't care what player, what free agent gives any player a chance to win a world series every single season. And as Taylor, as you mentioned, Taylor's 31, this is his shot to, this is, this is the window in which he wants to get another ring. And this is a great opportunity for him. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, you got to remember who Chris Taylor is. I mean, he's like the most boring person on the planet. Uh, I feel like 60, $64 million is too much money for him. I feel like he'd be down to just give some of it back because it's just not necessary for his lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, after he buys his second surfboard, then what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, retired at home and wherever he's from North Carolina or somewhere, Virginia, I believe actually Virginia, Yeah, Beach. He's Virginia beach. Yeah. He can throw the biggest wedding that he wants now. Uh, everyone's wearing flannels and gray sweatpants. So in a corresponding move, because the Dodgers 40 man roster is full, the Dodgers designated for assignment Sheldon noisy, who they acquired last season from the Oakland athletics, but because of the MLB lockout, which we will address momentarily, Sheldon noisy is in limbo, meaning that he can't go anywhere. He cannot sign with a team because he's still technically under the Dodgers control because of this lockout, they can't release him. They can't trade him. So like I said, he's stuck in literal limbo, which sucks for noisy, but in the same sense, it's kind of karma for him being a Dodgers bust, first of all, and not stretching in that monumental game against the giants, which ultimately cost us the division. It was yeah, a brutal I, stretch. It was, it was, yeah, but I, I wouldn't, it, I don't think it's, I don't think it's punishment, but yeah, he is floating out somewhere in the Milky way. Um, and, and it's kind of a weird thing. I've, I've never seen this happen before where, uh, well, we haven't had a, a lockout in some time, but like it is, it is a first when um, you see some of these deals that weren't quite completed. I think the Padres uh, agreed to a deal with a pitcher uh, who is in some league, yeah, not Korea or something, Korea, yeah, or something like that. And his deal got held up because they missed the deadline. Um, so th yeah, this is, this is strange, but unfortunately, I mean, look, Andrew Freeman's going to go out there. He's going to try and find guys off the scrap heap. Some work out, some don't, but you know, the it, it's low risk, high reward. And so that was what noisy was. And unfortunately he didn't really pan out. I mean, all I got to say on this is, Find someone who believes in you as much as the Dodgers believe in Luke Rayleigh, because <laughs> he has survived all of these DFAs. It started with, you know, DJ Peters down the line, Uceta, Santana, Noisy. All these guys are, are gone, and Luke Rayleigh remains. He's an institution. It, it also has to kind of say to, to an effect that there were a lot of bad guys on the Dodgers roster last season which I think I'm not accustomed to given we're kind of spoiled over that 2017 to 2019 stretch. There were a lot of bad guys that were on this Dodgers team in 2021. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, be that bench was just brutal. You get spoiled when you got guys like Chris Taylor and Muncie who end up being all stars. And then you expect, you know, Rayleigh and, and noisy and Peters to basically replicate that. And it's, it is unfair to them. Uh, granted they're major leaguers. And if you're going to be in the major leagues, you need to perform like a major leaguer. But the expectations of these guys that Friedman finds are, are a bit high in terms of Dodger fans because of yep. the past. So it's MLB lockout season. 
don't know when they're going to come to an agreement. Maybe you guys can help me help me out on that in a second. But what I can tell you about this MLB lockout, this is the first lockout since 94, 95, I want to say, when the season got canceled. And the, the Expos, what was it? One of those years, the Expos were in first place. Then they canceled the season, and that kind of sucked for Montreal. But back to the point, the lockout, meaning the winter meetings in Orlando, canceled. The Rule 5 draft, which we actually talked about an episode or two ago, delayed. No players can talk to any of their guys on their team, meaning no players that are in the free agent market right now can sign. No executives can discuss trades amongst teams and no agents can even to an effect talk to any teams as well. Meaning free agency is dead. The hot stove is dead. We are stuck in this weird period now where we basically cannot really discuss rumors other than maybe what was trickled out from the pre lockout, which we'll get to later in the episode. But yeah, it's weird on MLB.com. You look at teams rosters, they took away all the pictures, they're faceless. I think the rules are so extreme that you, a team can't even post happy birthday about one of their own players because there's no <laughs> yeah. affiliation allowed right now. And as far as I can do, as far as I can see in my research, there's no meetings planned to discuss this next CBA to get this thing on the map. Yeah, the only thing that the Dodgers have done recently was make it up to a dog on TikTok. <laughs> like yeah. that's the only thing that they, they 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 I mean they have enough time on their hands now to put that together uh, and bring a dog to Dodger Stadium. Uh, it's just such a weird story. Yeah, um, I was over it the second I saw it. I, oh yeah, literally I was over it before I figured out what the explanation was because I did, I wasn't privy to it. Yeah, Toby um, needs to get over himself. Yeah. <laughs> cute dog though but yeah this is no this is strange this is really weird and uh i'm not sure when it's going to end um in all likelihood and and i'm i sort of have a glass half full approach here is that it will get done before uh we discuss losing games spring training games i think that um no the uh, losing games is not in the interest of any party uh when you when you talk to the owners when you talk about the players nobody wants to not have you know any part of the season lost uh, as a result of these negotiations but there seems to be a lot on the table and these sides are nowhere close and in fact on the final day uh, before the lockout the last meeting that they had lasted about seven minutes yeah i remember that that was crazy yeah i, I agree with jake I, I don't even care to get into how far apart the sides are what each side wants right now because uh, honestly a lot of it's crap um the owners are posturing the players association is posturing they're not going to do anything in the month of December. I can tell you that they're going to enjoy their Christmas and the owners have no desire to even make any concessions right now, because this, this plays into the owner's hands. Um, you know, it, it's going to hurt the players more the longer this goes because they have more to lose in terms of actual, you know, livelihood and, and money. Obviously the owners are going to pull in more money, but the players, you know, they need that money to, to survive. You know, the owners right. are, are going to be okay either way. Right. And that's why they instituted the lockout. I mean, that is sort of a negotiation tactic to make the players union come back to the table because that's, that's an option that the owners have. The option that the players have is a strike. Yeah. The only thing I can guarantee is we're going to get more playoffs. We're going to get more expanded playoffs. That's, that's going to be instant. And a DH. Yeah. I can almost guarantee that. But it's funny. The owners are using that as like a bargaining chip, which I guess makes kind of a little bit of sense because it create a little bit more opportunities for players. But I don't know. Yeah, I also think team control over players on the rookie contracts will be shortened as well. Yeah, that's that's going to hurt the Dodgers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a team that historically has benefited from shortened seasons, the Dodgers, 1981 and 2020. I am on the more pessimistic side. I'm not holding my breath. I think this is going to take longer than people want. But like David said, and I agree, we're really early into this. So there's no need to really dissect things right now. So I think it's appropriate to move on to a more awesome subject. And that involves Gil Hodges, elected by the Veterans Committee into the Baseball Hall of Fame. I think it was his last year of eligibility. I'm not, I, I might need to be fact checked on that. But regardless, he wore number 14 for the Dodgers, meaning that he is probably going to get his number retired. Stan Caston said himself yeah. that they hope to honor him during the 2022 season, making 
Kike Hernandez, the last Dodgers player to actually wear the number 14. But this is awesome. He was an eight-time All-Star, three-time World Series champion, two of them with the Dodgers. He hit 361 home runs over 16 seasons with the Dodgers over the course of Brooklyn and Los Angeles. And probably the most important thing other than Hodges family itself is that this was Vince Scully's guy. Yeah. For years, he had begged and basically preached that Gil Hodges is worthy of a Hall of Famer. And the fact that Scully now gets to see it during his lifetime, maybe that's the cherry on top that Scully has now just witnessed it all. Yeah, it's unfortunate, though, that Gil Hodges can't uh, witness it. Um, and I, I, I think this was, a, this was a long time coming. I mean, you've, if you look at the sort of the milestone numbers that you typically see for um, position players, like 500 home runs or 3,000 hits, I mean, he, he wasn't really close to that. But he's widely uh, regarded as, you know, the best, if not one of the best, uh, first baseman in Dodgers history. And he, you know, was an incredible hitter. I mean, he had, I'm looking at his stats right now. He had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven straight seasons of a hundred plus RBIs. I mean, that that's insane. He had 122 RBIs in 1953. I mean, the guy was a really just productive, good hitter. He finished in the MVP uh, voting uh, quite often, but never won an MVP. He finished high as high as eighth in MVP voting in 1950. Uh, Kevin mentioned all his all-star all, all -star appearances. He also uh, won a World Series with the Mets, their first ever World Series title in 1969. So this guy, this guy was a winner. And he's a champion. And it, this is a really cool moment in Dodgers history. Yeah, yeah I'm happy for the family. I, I don't know too much about him. I know, you know, he was a Dodgers legend. And st his stats, obviously. Obviously, I wasn't even close to alive to see him, you know, to see him play or anything. But if Vince Scully wants him in the Hall of Fame, then I want him in the Hall of Fame. So congratulations to the Hodges family. Yep. And, uh, also, it, it is worth noting that um, he missed two years in 1990, 1944 and 1945 uh, for serving in the military during the war. Yeah. That's awesome. And I also failed to mention he's second all time in Dodgers home runs behind Duke Snyder. Very that cool. is cool. That is cool. I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm going to add it in now last second just to spice up the show. Give me one Dodgers player that you think deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. They have to be retired. Someone that should be in, but they haven't gotten in. Oh, man, Kevin. You got to. There's, there's some really good options. Out While there. you think about that, I do have one quick correction to make. I said he finished high as eighth in MVP, Gil Hodges. Actually, it was seventh, and that was in 1957, uh, which was the last year the Dodgers were in Brooklyn. So just wanted to make that correction. Okay. Um, a player that should be in the Hall of Fame that isn't for the Dodgers? Yep. There's a few of them. Is Duke Snyder is in the Hall of Fame, yes? Yeah. Yes. Basically, every retired number that the Dodgers have, yeah, that's right. those guys are in the Hall. Uh, I mean, the guys that come to mind are, are – just do Fernando one. Valenzuela and Oral Hershiser. Obviously, they don't have the, the longevity in terms of stats, but what they did in, in that short period of dominance, I, I feel like, you know, is worthy of consideration. Okay. I'm not necessarily going to push for them, but put on the spot. Those, those would be my answers. Oh. Okay. We'll give you Fernando. Cause you said my guy, unless Jake wants to do oral, then go ahead. Oh, you, yeah. I mean, oral Hershiser does, does come to mind. I mean, he, he was a, a terrific pitcher of his era yeah. um, had the, the scoreless inning streak. Um, he was unbelievable on that 1988 postseason. I mean, just unreal. They relied on him so heavily and he came through pretty much every single time. Yeah. And actually oral does have the longevity. He pitched 18 season has, has over 200 wins, uh, 56 war, the Cy Young, the world series. I'm actually not sure how oral hasn't gotten in. Cause in my opinion, he checks all the boxes and then someone that I'll just throw in real quick, who I think is going to get in eventually by the veterans committee uh, is Steve Garvey. The guy was ahead of his time. He was basically the iron man before Pete Rose played like every game 
won a World Series, uh, defensive, or actually, I don't know if the defensive wizard was there, but it, the hitting was there. 2,600 hits, basically, 294 batting average. He's on the cusp. He played 19 years, but yeah, Steve Garvey, MVP, Gold Glover, numerous times, All Star, a whole bunch, and the World Series, like I mentioned. Couple fun facts about Steve Garvey. He walked me across the street on my first day of kindergarten. Wow. And later on in my life, we would, when I was playing club travel baseball, we would play his team in tournaments occasionally. And he was kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so this All is right. a, So that's out there now. Yep. This comes from one of our listeners. Looks like he changed his Twitter handle a little bit. Jay the Flip, formerly I think Josh the Flip, but Jay the Flip. Would you root for Carlos Correa if he comes to the Dodgers? Go ahead. So that's a question that um, no one's ever asked before. Um, no, um, everyone's asked that question. Uh, I, I posed that question a few months ago, um, and I got a wide range of responses. Um, obviously, there were a lot of people that said that they would never vote, they would never root for him. Um, Jeff Snyder wanted to kind of haggle over the definition of cheer versus root. Um, would you actively cheer for someone or would you root for them to do well? Look, here's the thing. Carlos Correa is, will always be known as the guy that was the biggest dick to come out of that Astros cheating scandal. Yep. I mean, the, the interviews that he gave the back and forth with Cody Bellinger and Justin Turner, he didn't even care that he cheated, never really was remorseful at any point. Um, and so that will always be his legacy. Now, with that being said, if he puts on a Dodgers uniform and he is a decent member of society, those are the two qualifications, then yeah, I'm going to pull for him because I pull for the team. I, I root for these guys. I root for them to do well. I'm not going to boo our own players. Um, I used to do that when I was a little kid and I didn't know better, but now, you know, growing up and, and, re and realizing that it's, that it's dumb to do that. Or I, I, I don't believe in booing I boo Pedro guys. Baez. I boo Pedro Baez. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, have no I think shame. I did. I think I did too. Hand up. All right. At one right. point, at one point. All right. So basically what I'm saying is I'm better than you guys. Um, <laughs> and so, no, um, no, I, I mean, look, I, I would, I would root for the Dodgers. I mean, are you kidding? Like, yeah, of course, you know, the, it's, it's going to sting. It's going to get some t taking used to, if he ends up signing with us, I still don't think it's going to happen though. I really don't think so. I think the Dodgers have a better shot uh, at signing Freddie Freeman. Okay. Here's my answer. And I kind of hinted at this l last week. I'm going to root for whoever plays for the Dodgers. I don't care. Whatever the, the, the thing below Al Qaeda is, that is my standard for if you have a Dodgers uniform on. Jesus. If, if you are one below Al Qaeda and you have a Dodgers uniform on, I'm going to root for you. That is just how I, I, I am a fan of. I am a fan of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Secondly, the Al Qaeda seal of approval from yeah, David. Well, Rosenthal. not not quite Al Qaeda, below Al Qaeda. I want to make that very clear. I, I'm not pro Al Qaeda. This is not a pro Al Qaeda podcast. My second point, Carlos Correa is the type of player who you absolutely love if he's on your team and you despise if he's not on your team. We've had a couple of guys like that in, in, in on the Dodgers. Yasiel Puig was one of them. Max Muncy is kind of one of them. So over time, if Carlos Correa is a Dodger, which I don't think he will be, fans are going to warm up to him. They're going to get over 2017. They're going to get over his annoying ridiculous comments about all this stuff and his, his stupid dickish behavior. Once he puts on a Dodgers uniform, all bets are off. And you're going to see if that ever happens, more fans are going to come on that bandwagon than not. There's going to be that small 1% of fans who are going to complain about everything that are not going to like him. They're going to take a stand. Good. Trim the fat, get out of here. Also to, to that point, for those fans that say, Oh, I'm not going to root for the Dodgers or I'm not going to watch them ever again. Load good. Of crap. Good. Load of crap. Yes, that too, but also good. We don't need you. Yeah. My short answer is still yes. I would root for Carlos Correa, but this sets up perfectly into the next part of the show that I wanted to talk about, which is I guess I was wrong because there are reports out there that show that the Dodgers are actually interested in Carlos Correa. Don't have the fine details just yet, but one executive said that he believes 
it will come down to the Dodgers or the Houston Astros in signing Carlos Correa. And I know on air, I said not too long ago, the Dodgers would not go for Carlos Correa, but if they do sign him, I'm going to have to eat my hat and be openly honest and say, yeah, I was wrong because I don't know why the Dodgers would want Carlos Correa, to be honest, given that they have Trey Turner at shortstop. I know that Carlos Correa said he would be open to playing third base. And I guess in the long term of things that there would be an opening at third base for the Dodgers. But I do have some more comments in a second, but I wanted to just pass it back over to you guys if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, the one report that I saw um, about Correa and the Dodgers being linked was from uh, Mark Berman, who is a uh, Houston Fox 26 reporter. Guy has a so many i i know him personally he has so many contacts in the houston area so you can you know you can believe what he's reporting out there he's he's legit um and what he reported was that there were a number of teams that kicked the tires on carlos correa the dodgers were one of them according to correa's agent um so read into that what you will but i think the dodgers are going to be kicking the tires pretty much on any big free agent out there just to see what the interest is and what you know how much they how much they're they're going for i agree um i still don't think it's going to happen i would also have to eat my words like kevin if it does happen uh but in terms of third base if they sign carlos correa you're not gonna be able to afford trey turner as well so it's it's you will be the shortstop going forward if, if right. they sign him i meant like for 2022 yeah yeah even then, though, I, I think you might have to slide Trey Turner over to second because Carlos Correa is a phenomenal Ooh, shortstop. He, he, he would not like that. Well, that's not really up to him, frankly, because <laughs> he is, you know, on the Dodgers for at least another year. That is true. Unless they trade him. Yeah. <laughs> the Dodgers, at this moment in time, they don't need Carlos Correa. Yeah. What they need is a leader. Carlos Correa is not a leader. He might be a great teammate to his guys, but he's not a leader. What they need is a leader, and that leader is Freddie Freeman who the Dodgers reportedly are also in- linked to. It's the Braves as the favorites, the Dodgers second, and then the Yankees as kind of a sleeper team in the mix. Man, if the Dodgers could get Freddie Freeman, I was bummed about losing Corey Seager. Corey Seager, as good as he is, he's also not a leader. Freddie Freeman is an upgrade over Corey Seager, and putting him into that Dodgers lineup potentially might be the greatest team we've ever seen on paper in terms of the position players. We said that last year too, but I agree. Yes. I, I think Freeman is way more likely than Correa. Uh, I still don't think he's going to leave Atlanta, but if he does leave Atlanta, I think the Dodgers are, are a very real possibility you know, from orange County makes a lot of sense. I'm sort of shocked that they weren't that Atlanta wasn't able to sign Freddie Freeman before the lockout. That seemed like a slam dunk. To yeah. Me. What are that they seemed, doing? It seemed like a no brainer. Like, are you kidding? You just won a world series. This guy wants to remain in Atlanta. He's the face of your franchise. What What are you doing? Yeah. And you, keep in mind, they already have Ronald Acuna and Ozzy Albies for like minimum wage. Like they're paying those guys, nothing, absolutely nothing. They bamboozled those guys, took advantage of them, frankly, uh, and what are you doing, Atlanta? What are you doing? My only thinking could be that they're more concerned about paying Austin Riley and that they're cheap. You know, we saw the Nationals let uh, Anthony Rendon walk. That actually worked out for them. We saw the Astros let George Springer walk. Overall, that's worked out for them. So maybe Atlanta's thinking, you know, we got the best we could get. We could get out of Freddie Freeman. We got our World Series ring. We got some guys maybe coming up in the pipeline. And so we'll let Freddie just go elsewhere because we did all we wanted to do. I don't know for, for six years, 160, which is, I think is what he's asking for. uh, Please. It's chump change. Just get him already. Yeah. I don't know what's, if that's all it's going to take, I don't know what's holding up the Dodgers on their end. You make that happen because like I said, he's going to add a whole different dynamic to this clubhouse, the leadership he brings. We've saw some, articles actually that came out during this regular season how he just pushes all his teammates he gives them a hard time if they take a day off for like no apparent reason the Dodgers need that they need someone to shake up this clubhouse because they got a little complacent last season we saw them overcome adversity in 2020 the shortened season the deficit to the Braves but when the going got tough in 2021 this team kind of tucked their tail between their legs I, I don't know about that I, I I have an issue with that statement I, I really don't think they did I think they just didn't perform um i don't think most of the guys got complacent i i I really don't i think they you know fully wanted to win they wanted to repeat 
Um, I think the team is just full of nice people. I think they don't really show their emotions on their sleeve. I think they keep it to themselves. They keep it within the locker room. And look, I said this online. Uh, if they sign Freddie Freeman, they need to sign an asshole with him uh, because we need some fire. We need some emotion. We need some, some flair on this Dodgers team because that locker room, like I just said, it is, is just like guys you want to take your grandma to Walmart. Uh, I mean, we need some guy who's just going to fire these guys up, make other fans hate us, make other players don't like our team. We have that a little bit with Muncie, uh, but we need we need a, a little more than that. Especially that sound, it sounds like it sounds like Carlos Correa to me, from what yep. you're describing. Yep. <sighs> yeah, I don't, I don't agree. I think I don't care about fans hating us. What I need is for someone to push our guys. And to me, Freeman does that. And it, you can look at their success. They just won the World Series, despite losing like half their team. So. Something else that's worth mentioning that came up in the news recently. Dodgers bench coach Bob Guerin is interviewing with the Mets. The Mets have a manager vacancy, obviously. And if the Dodgers were to lose Bob Guerin as their bench coach, that to me is almost as huge a blow to the team as it would be losing Dave Roberts, because I feel like Guerin kind of holds this all together and has always been the, the, the Robin to Roberts Batman. Yeah. It's a good comparison, but yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I think that, um, that Bob Guerin, who has been a manager before would probably take another managerial job if it was offered to him. Yeah. But if we've also seen some other reporting that Max Scherzer wants Buck Showalter to be the manager of the Mets. So, which I that, don't get, that might Stupid. be, so, that might be something that, that happens before, uh, before Bob Guerin, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, uh, no one else takes a look at Bob Guerin. Yeah, you know, I would be happy for Bob Guerin. Uh, it would be a loss, but the Dodgers would be more than fine. Uh, there's plenty of good baseball minds out there. The Mets are also interviewing first base coach Clayton McCullough, yep. uh, which is kind of weird. But um, it's very random. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. I was like, okay. Yeah. But I just want to talk about Max Scherzer real quick. I didn't realize how needy this guy was. You know, I, I, I mean, between you know, that don't touch me when I'm pitching and, and all these, you know, warming up in full uniform. And if someone's going to watch me warm up in full uniform, you better be in full uniform too. Uh, and now you want Buck Showalter. Uh, I, I mean, talk about a step backwards for an organization would be hiring Buck Showalter. And I, I honestly think this stems from him being pulled with like 98 pitches, like twice as a Dodger. Because you know damn well Buck Showalter is gonna send him out there and be like, "Yep, go as long as you can go." And you know, you know what's funny about Buck Showalter is that twice in his career, I don't think he's ever won a World Series, but twice, no. twice in his career, he's left a franchise, and that next same next year they won the World Series. Uh, Was it I think a Arizona, Arizona, and the Yankees. That's right. So. Maybe, 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 maybe that's what the Mets are thinking. Sign Good Show Walter, show, sign Show Walter to a one-year deal. They don't make the playoffs, and then whoever they sign next, and they win the World Series. Good luck, that's, Chuck. That's a good, good luck, point. Buck. Yeah, <laughs> and the Rangers were not too far off either. They lost back-to-back -back World Series, but I believe Show Walter was right before Ron Washington. Yep. I don't, I don't get the Show Walter hype. This guy is just an old man at this point who hasn't really proven anything. You guys just basically gave his track record. Meanwhile, you have Bob Guerin, who is probably the best bench coach in the league. He's been to four World Series, three with the Dodgers and one with the Mets. I don't know how any team hasn't hired him, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I'm surprised he's lasted this long. Uh, this might be a familiar face or name to David, but we have time for this real quick. From Rain Man 22 I think that's how you yep. say it. <laughs> I, I know him a bit. <laughs> Give us some, give us your thoughts on the Max Scherzer comments on how he thought the Dodgers coaches ruined him. Jake, you want to go first? This comment was very bizarre to me because logically it didn't make any sense. What he essentially said was, is that because Dave Roberts and the Dodgers coaching staff limited his pitches down the stretch, it's what led to his dead arm in the postseason which to me, I don't really understand. It just sounds like he was making an excuse for why his arm just gave out. But to me, he's 37 years old. You're not going to 
have him throw 100 plus pitches every single time out. But as Dave Vasse pointed out, he went into like the seventh or eighth inning pretty much every start out there. So it's not like they were taking him out in the fifth or sixth every time and limiting him to 70 to 80 pitches. He actually did throw a lot of pitches. It's just unfortunate that when they got to the postseason, his arm gave out. But let's say we believe him, right? Let's say for the sake of argument, we believe that his not pitching enough was what led to his dead arm. Why, why wouldn't you say anything? And I'm, I don't know if he did or didn't, but like that to me is something you go, Hey, Dave, I realized something. My arm needs more pitches. I need more mileage on my arm because that's what I'm used to. Let me go. You don't think that Dave Roberts and, and everyone else would say, okay, Max, whatever you want. Yeah. You know, he, he came off ever since he left the Dodgers. He came off as like a travel baseball dad talking about his son, needing more playing time, needing more pitching, all that kind of stuff. Very off, off-putting comments for, from Max Scherzer basically the entire offseason. Um, phenomenal player, phenomenal competitor, but kind of a big baby. I mean, he sounds like a giant baby. That's just what it is. Uh, would I have liked him back on the Dodgers for the right contract? You bet. But – Look, if you want to go to New York and make half a, you know, half a hundred million dollars every single season and have Buck Showalter let you throw 130 pitches every game, be my guest, Max. Uh, Because frankly, I I just don't see how that's going to work out. Uh, When have the Mets ever taken care of their pitchers? Jacob deGrom hurt every year. Noah Syndergaard perennially hurt, like hasn't, haven't pitched since like the fucking Obama administration. Uh, Steven Matz got hurt on the Mets. I, I, I mean, look, I, I just think it's a horrible fit. I think he went where the money was. I think he was always going to go where the money was. But frankly, he came off like a giant baby. And also, just very quickly before you go, Kevin, here I was thinking that the Dodgers using him out of relief in the NLDS was what led. And I was, I was singing it from the rooftops that it was such a mistake and it didn't really make sense why they went to him in that ninth inning to close out the game when they had other options. But maybe they should have started in that game or piggybacked him off of Julio Urias. Who knows? But it's just very unfortunate. And it's also unfortunate that he didn't, wasn't able to go in game six when the Dodgers desperately needed him to. Yeah. And keep in mind, he was ass for the last couple starts of the season. He was legitimately bad giving up four or five runs every start. Uh, don't think that's because we didn't pitch you. That's just me. Poor shit. Max Scherzer. Those comments are pure. Bullshit, horse shit. The data shows, according to some people that did the math on Twitter, he averaged 98 pitches while with the Nationals the first half of 21. Came to the Dodgers and averaged about 95, 96 pitches a start with the Dodgers. So you're trying to tell me two pitches really made the difference? Yeah, it's okay. a lot of crap. And I also remember him kind of throwing the Nationals under the bus before he came to the Dodgers, saying that his routine was all out of whack, that he needed to be on like a certain amount of rest. I think, what was it? He needs to go every four days and the Nationals were like throwing him off or something. And that's why his tricep was out of whack and he was a little shaky towards the end of his tenure. So this guy is just full of excuses. And that's the perfect fit for the Mets because that's all they do in New York, the Queens side of town, make excuses. So good luck, Max. Big baby. Apologies in advance because I know I promised to do this next part of the show weeks ago, but we kept getting delayed, but it's here now. I'm talking about the inaugural Incline Dodgers Awards. So thank you everyone who participated and voted in, in our nomination ceremony online. We had great reactions from people saying that they love some of the categories and I'm excited to announce all the winners in just a few moments. We're gonna go category by category. I believe there's 13 categories this season. David came up with some good ones. Jake came up with some good ones. I came up with some okay ones. <laughs> you can try to figure out who came up with what, and then we'll go from there. But yeah, let's get this started. The inaugural Incline Dodgers Awards, the 2021 season. Uh, the first category is the Eric Gagne, Reliever of the Year. The nominees were Phil Bickford, Kenley Jansen, Joe Kelly, and Blake Trinan. This really only came down to two relievers. Who wants to take a guess at who won this one? Trinan. Yes. Would be my guess. 
With 62.5% of the votes, Blake Trinan is your Eric Gagne reliever of the year for 2021. And- Well-deserved friend of the show. <laughs> where, where were the uh, other, where was Kenley at? Kenley took home uh, 35% of the vote. Yeah, sounds about right. The next category is blooper of the year. This one Kevin, I one. think you should. I think you should read out all the the percentages, or just if if you if you have them. Uh, okay. Blooper of the year. The nominees were, ball girl tackles idiot who runs onto the field during Dodgers <laughs> versus Angels, cat runs onto Coors Field grass, nacho guy in home run seats at Dodgers Stadium. And Justin Turner costs Cody Bellinger a home run with base running blunder on opening day. By the way, I, I feel like we should have seen it coming with that being the first thing that happened to the Dodgers on opening day, that, that Very non-home bad home run. Just yeah. awful for the rest of how it went. Oh, yeah. All right, Kevin, who's the winner? Any Ball guesses? Girl. Ball girl? Okay. What about you, David? Uh, yeah, that. It was actually with 50 and a half percent of the vote. Justin Turner cost Cody Bellinger wow. the opening day home run. Ball girl finished second with 22% and not too far behind at 19% was the nacho guy. I, I voted for the ball girl. I just thought in terms of the good fortune that it, that it, the, the positivity, I should say of the play uh, the awareness, the athleticism that she displayed, uh, and also how it kind of set social media on fire, that it was the best, the best of the, of, of, of those. Yep. Good form, good form tackle from her. Yep. Pretty cute too. My dad. I was at that. I was at that game. The next category is gone too soon. Dodgers that were let go. The nominees, DJ Peters, Dennis Santana, Yoshi Sutsugo, and Edwin Yuseta. And this one only came down to two, and it was by a slim margin. Give me your guess. I think DJ Peters is going to win this one. Okay. Same. And yes, with 45.5% of the vote, DJ Peters did win the gone too soon Dodgers that were lost award Dodgers that were let go award. And he was in the news recently. I think we brought it up earlier. He signed with a new team. He was let go by the Rangers and he's now in the KBO. He is going to Asia. I voted for DJ Peters because I felt like he was gone too soon. I, I'm on, I'm of the camp that they, the Dodgers didn't really give him that much of a runway to try and prove that he was good. And I still don't think that he got a fair shake and he performed, he didn't perform great, but he definitely displayed his, his home run pop with the Rangers. And when you consider all the other guys that uh, had stayed with the club past DJ Peters, definitely DJ Peters was gone too soon. I voted for Peters as well. And I'll take my L. I thought he was going to be a nice bench role player for the Dodgers and it didn't pan out. He was bad. He went to the Rangers, hit some home runs, was also bad. And that's why he finds himself in the KBO. The next category is the Gargantuan Nutsack Award. Oh, yeah. This was one of David's. The nominees are Kenley Jansen, Evan Phillips, Julio Urias, and Alex Vesia. I'm curious to see who won this one because I really don't know. Uh, I don't know if we. I, I wanted it to be the an individual performance, but I think people voted on the the overall, you know, longevity of the nutsack over the season. Yeah. Okay. I'll just tell you what happened. Evan Phillips got seven point seven percent. Kenley Jansen got sixteen and a half percent. Julio Urias got thirty. Point eight percent, and your winner for the first Nutsack Award, friend of the show as well, with forty-five percent of the vote, Alex Vesia. We will let him know 
We definitely will let him know. But he would, he, make, would, he would like to know, actually. He would, he would love that. He would, he would enjoy that a lot. I, I would like to add one thing. Since this was my award, I would like to give an individual gargantuan nutsack performance of the year award to Dennis Santana for striking out Fernando Tatis, bottom of the ninth in San Diego, bases loaded, keeping it a tie game. Dennis Santana with the individual gargantuan nutsack performance of the year award. This next category we had one, two, three, four, looks like five nominees. It's the first ever Gerardo Parra ultimate Dodger killer in the 2021 season. The nominees were Tyler O'Neill, Buster Posey, Eddie Rosario, Blake Snell, and Fernando Tatis Jr. I voted for Buster Posey. Who did you guys vote for? I voted for Eddie Rosario, but yeah, I don't, I don't think. To. Yeah. I don't think he's I don't think he won though. I don't see how he couldn't win. <laughs> With about 56% of the vote, Eddie Rosario takes home the Gerardo Parra Good. Ultimate <laughs> Dodger Killer. Yeah. I feel like that's some recency bias with the oh, NLCS. It is. 100%. But- Complete recency bias, but you talk about a guy that literally destroyed us. He was that guy. A- yeah. And and at the most crucial point too. Dropped his nutsack all over our face. The sixth award is the Zombie Nation throwback if you were at Dodger Stadium when home runs were hit because this is the Zombie Nation Home Run of the Year Award. We got four nominees in this one. Cody Bellinger, NLCS, three-run home run against the Braves. The Dodgers, one plus four versus the Padres on September 29th. The Chris Taylor wild card walk-off two-run home run against the Cardinals. And finally, the Will Smith three-run walk-off home run versus the Giants on July 20th. This should be a landslide. This needs to be Chris Taylor wild card game by, I'm going to guess, 72%. I was going to go with Cody Bellinger. So those are the one and two. Cody Bellinger finished second with 25%. 56% of the vote went to Chris Taylor's wild card walk-off home run. Not high enough. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i was at that that one plus four game that was pretty cool but you talk about the when the dodgers needed it the most chris taylor pushing them into the nlds but i voted for cody bellinger's home run just because that was a literal back from the dead home run in the playoffs and it kept the dodgers alive in that nlcs This one is the most gift-worthy moment. Mookie Betts game-ending catch against the Padres. And I think you can infer that the beating of the chest is part of that. I don't know if everyone knew that. Mm -hmm. Mookie Betts throws out Wilmer Flores for trying to reach third base in the NLDS. Mookie with two of the four nominees. A.J. Pollock, over-the-wall catch, robs Manny Machado of a home run. And finally, the Trey Turner slide at home plate against the Phillies. This was one of the biggest blowouts. With it's got to be Trey Turner, right? Yep, Trey with Turner. Nearly 75% of the vote. Trey Turner takes home the most gift-worthy moment with that slide that just went viral all over the internet. I was going to say, that that was the, the most gift-worthy moment of all, of all of baseball. This is the closest one of all categories. It's your host's. Most failed take set on air. <laughs> I'm interested in this one. I like this. <laughs> David with saying the Giants will drop off by game 100. <laughs> what actually happens is that the Giants proceed to win 107 games. <laughs> the most games ever. <laughs> ever. Literally ever. <laughs> win division and take Dodgers to five in the NLDS. <laughs> And yes, they did break their franchise record. Oh my God, I love that. They're gonna what are you going to what are you gonna do, man? I, can't, I, I died with my take, man. What are yeah. you going to do? Yeah, you have about five five different bodies on that hill, too. Yeah, and I'll you continue it. it. You said it so many times. Roll it over to next year, too, man. They're going to die next year, too. Just roll it over. Uh, Jake, this was said near the beginning of the season. Yeah, well, actually, before the season. Kenley Jansen isn't a high leverage guy anymore. Kenley Jansen proceeds to finish with a 222 ERA, his best since 2017, and converts 
38 of 43 save opportunities. Who, who predicted that? Seriously. <laughs> Come on. Contra- contract to your magic. And finally, Kevin, myself, with Gliber Torres, will win the AL MVP. Proceeds to finish with a war below one and just nine <laughs> home runs and a 259, 331, 366 slash line <laughs> and 19 airs. Do you really have 19 errors too? Yeah. Wow. This has got to be a category every single year because this is just it, too good. I honestly be. don't know who's going to win this. I think they're it's all, gonna, they're all good. I think it's going to be me or Kevin is going to win it. Okay. So David finished in last with 30. This is a good thing to finish in last with 30. Wow. 8% of the vote. Thank you voters. And the winner with 36.3% of the vote. Why do I goes, think it's me? Goes to Jake <laughs> saying Kenley Jansen isn't a high leverage guy anymore. <laughs> I finished second with the Gliber Torres with 33% of the vote. Wait, so, so what did I what was it? What did I get? 30 what? 36.3. Okay, so okay, good. It wasn't a blowout. At least no, it was a little close. It was the closest by this is the closest one of the night. Yeah. We all within just a few percentage points. Why? Okay, so why i mean i don't know why uh i i won this award but why do we think because first of all i was saying it all season long yes maybe jansen shouldn't be the primary closer but to call him not a high leverage guy anymore meaning like he's a brandon league or a chris hatcher or chris perez where you have to throw him in blowout situations was just kind of idiotic it was the phrasing I think that's what it was. I okay, think it was yeah, just, maybe the phrasing. If you, if you had if you said he wasn't going to be the closer versus wasn't going to be a high leverage guy, I don't think you win this. I think it was well, I mean it was a, it would have been a bad take either way given how it panned out, but I I mean I looked at what happened in the postseason in 2020 and the fact that Julio Urias became the long man slash closer of this team and how you couldn't have Kenley Jansen anywhere near a close game. Uh, we saw what happened in in game 4 of the World Series. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of defensive miscues, but he should have gotten out of that before that even had a chance to take place. You just look at that, what happened at the end of 2020, and I, I just I could not see how he could do any better than that. And at, at his age, it looked like he was slowing down. It wasn't a bad take. I'd make that take again, given, given, the, given what happened in 2020. So I stand by that. Jansen went from a thrower to a pitcher. And I think that's what's safe. Uh, and I'll say this, Jan- what Jansen did in 2021 shocked me to my core. I would have never guessed that he would have been that good. Maybe yeah, decent, I mean, but he definitely exceeded my expectations beyond my wildest imagination. Completely reinvented himself. His entire repertoire, everything. So I, I think I, I'm cutting you some slack, but I'm, it's still funny that you won. Yeah, it is funny. Yeah, given given the other two takes, it is it is quite funny. Yeah. All right. Because my mine, I was just insistent the entire season. Like you said yeah. that preseason, but mine, I I thought I was for sure gonna win that just because I was. Well, that was that was why Giants I thought fall apart. Giants gonna fall apart. <laughs> That's why I thought that's why I thought you were going to win this category because I only said it at the beginning of the season and then yeah. I never reiterated it again because of what Jansen was doing. But you saw the Giants doing well and <laughs> yeah. doubled down. Yeah. Fuck them, man. I don't, I don't all till the day I die. That's I'll, the beauty of this category. You just have yeah. to say it once and you're eligible. Yeah. One time and you're screwed. This was another close one. The Dodgers, Cy Young, fan vote style. The nominees are Walker Buehler, Kenley Jansen, Max Scherzer, and Julio Urias. This came down to two pitchers, Julio Urias and Walker Buehler. And the final between the two was, or or, I'm not going to give that part away, but 36.3% versus 40.7%. Who do you think won? Buehler. I I think Julio. Walker Buehler takes it home with 40.7% this go around could have been either one both deserve it absolutely the next one is the stupid bastard of the year yes i kind of we had wonder who came up with that (laughs) (laughs) we had we kind of had some winners in mind we had to make some changes i added a guy we got censored 
this one yeah for this good one's, reason this one's kind of <laughs> this one's kind of close-ish and probably tough to predict but the nominees are ben and woods keith olbermann aj preller and michael schwab i don't really feel like explaining who all these guys are but if you want to explain any of them real quick go for it uh i'll tell you how this worked out though in last place with 16 percent of the vote is ben and woods they host this show for the Padres and all that, San Diego sports radio, idiotic Twitter guys. Keith Olbermann, or sorry, I skipped a guy. Michael Schwab with 19.5%. I don't even know what he does. Nothing. <laughs> Exists. Some, just some Astros fan? Yeah, he's just not, he says he's a guy, a reporter, but he's not a reporter. He's just some idiot. So that leaves it between Keith Olbermann and AJ Preller. Who are you picking to win this one? I went with AJ Preller. I I think they both deserve it for very different reasons. So I'm curious to see who's going to win this. I also voted for this winner. And with 35.5% of the vote, the stupid bastard of the year goes to AJ Preller. Self-explanatory. Seems like every trade he does for the Padres just backfires. He acted like Jace Tingler was going to be this guy to lead the Padres to the promised land. They missed the playoffs. He fired Tingler. Every trade that he's almost done for the most part has not worked out. You got Mike Clevenger, who they blew out his elbow after like two starts. You got Ty France tearing it up for the Mariners. And then- yeah, I remember when everyone said they won the offseason? Yeah, that's that's the Mets this year. We'll see what happens. The offseason is far from done. Maybe the Dodgers will take home that crown. This is a wipeout as well. But here we go. Best individual game. The nominees are Mookie Betts going four for four in game five of the NLDS. Walker Buehler takes a no-hitter into the eighth against the uh, Diamondbacks. I don't know why I screwed up something there. But anyways, A.J. Pollock, Grand Slam, eight RBI performance at the Brewers. And Chris Taylor, three-run home run game. Three, three, uh, Chris Taylor, three home run game in the NLCS against the Braves with C- CT three in a landslide, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. With nearly <laughs> a, with nearly three fourths of the vote, CT three takes home the award with that three home run performance in the NLCS. What was the percentage? Uh, 74%. Category 12. We're almost near the end. This one is called the Andre Ethier regular season clutch moment. Pretty self-explanatory. The nominees go to Gavin Lux, bottom of the eighth, home run off Rafael Montero against the Mariners. Max Muncy, ninth inning, game-tying home run off Craig Kimbrell at the Chicago Cubs. Corey Seager, go ahead, 12th inning, two-run home run off Tim Hill at the Padres. And Chris Taylor, 14 pitch at bat versus Henesis Cabrera of the St. Louis Cardinals, which results in a three run double. Wow, this is going to be a close one, I feel. Yeah, I would give it to Lux because I feel like that kind of turned the Dodgers season around, but I don't think he's going to win it. So Lux finished in third with 13% of the vote. Finishing in second with 25% of the vote goes to Corey Seager. And the winner with 56% of the vote Whoa. is Chris Taylor's 14 pitch at bat yep. against Henesis Cabrera. That was one of the best at bats of the season, regular season, especially, obviously. Well deserved for Chris Taylor. Chris Taylor has, it's quite, kind of remarkable how big of a fan favorite he's become. Yeah. He really is. I find that. Whenever I tweet about Chris Taylor, it usually does well. He's cleaning up tonight at the Incline Dodgers Awards. Yeah. Yeah. And at the expense of the Cardinals. <laughs> yeah. That's true. There's actually 14 <laughs> categories. I was wrong. I thought there were 13, but we're almost finished. This is the best one. The most Dave moment. We're talking about the most Dave Roberts idiotic decision. It's a good one to end on. Hence why it's the most Dave moment. This one is going to be a close one as well we got five nominees and it starts with matt Beatty has seven rbi game against the brewers 
doesn't record a single at bat. The still don't understand that. The following games in a doubleheader at the Cubs. Next up, Roberts bats Steven Souza Jr. over Gavin Lux and Austin Barnes with runners on second and third in a deciding moment during game six of the NLCS. Next up, who uses Roberts uses Julio Urias and Max Scherzer in relief in the postseason when he didn't need to. Roberts burns all first baseman in September 4th game versus the Giants. Dodgers lose game with Mills with Will Smith playing first base. And that game ended with Trey Turner and Smith not connecting on a pretty routine ground out. And thus the Giants were able to get a run across the plate to walk it off. And finally, Roberts uses Kenley Jansen versus the Giants on back-to-back nights after two blown saves in a row. I know that I know what David's answer was, and he's probably gonna he probably went with Steven Souza Jr. in that whole mess. Yep. But my my pick, and I'll explain after we get the results, was using Julio Urias and Max Scherzer out of relief. All right. So here we go with six and a half percent of the vote. Roberts burns all the first baseman with 9% of the vote. Matt Beatty's seven, R- seven RBI game doesn't get it at bat next up. Uh, with 12% of the vote is uses Kenley Jansen back-to-back nights with the Giants and all that. So it comes down to these two. With 31% of the vote in second place, Roberts' decision to bat Steven Souza Jr., Whoa. thus meaning the winner with 42% is using Julio Urias and Max Scherzer in relief when he didn't need to. You know, I'm happy that the uh, that the fans agreed with me on this because here here's why I think that is that was the worst move out of all of them. Understanding what the Dodgers' strength was this season was what their bullpen after their starting rotation was kind of depleted towards the end. The bullpen was the best bullpen we've ever seen in our lifetimes, top to bottom. The fact that the Dodgers elected not to rely more heavily on that bullpen when the starting pitching was depleted and the offense wasn't rising to the occasion, I'll never understand. So at the time, yes, because I even tweeted out, so I'll be very, very transparent about this. I tweeted out that when they put in uh, Julio Urias in game two of the NLCS, I agreed with the move at the time, just based on Julio's track record um, in the postseason coming out of relief. But after, after having time to think about it, and I wish that, that Roberts had thought about this too, is the fact that they didn't need to. It was, it was over-managing, in my opinion, and especially with Max Scherzer in Game 5. They didn't need to do that. It almost was a disaster uh, with Max Scherzer, even though he came through in that situation. Julio, it was a disaster. And, of course, why would you burn one of your starting pitchers like that when you need them and you don't have – you only have three? So that made no sense to me. They should have relied more heavily on their bullpen when the offense just wasn't there. The most Dave Roberts decision. There's been some good ones. If we had done these awards in the years past, I'm sure in 2019, Clayton Kershaw coming out of the bullpen would have, Oh, that would have been the landslide win. That would have been the landslide. That's a permanent winner. That's like, (laughs) it has its own like award every year and it wins every year for like all time. Dumb move. Rich Hills up there. 2018. Yep. 2018 pull on Rich Hill. 2017 might be a little closer. Maybe it would have been that 2017 game two, also involving Rich Hill. But we'll see what happens. I hope there's not anything bad in 2022 because the more nominees, the the worse for us. That means Dave Roberts is doing some really stupid shit. Yeah. And finally, the big one, the Dodgers MVP during the 2021 season. Five nominees, Mookie Betts, Max Muncy, Will Smith, Trey Turner, and Julio Urias. You probably can guess who won, but I don't know if you could guess who got second place. What, did Mun- Muncy I win? Give it to Muncy, yeah. So you think Muncy won? Yes. Who do you think got second place before was I was it Urias? That? It was Julio Urias with twenty four percent of the vote. That's so- interesting that he didn't win Cy Young, but won MVP. Well, no, he got second. He said. Oh, you're that, right. You're right. That just, I guess that just reflects that the rest of the Dodgers stars didn't perform up to standards if people were willing to vote oh, yeah. for a pitcher. But yes, Max Muncy, 
53% of the vote, your Dodgers MVP, which well says deserved. a lot too well about that injury and what, what, what might've been. Yep. It's the new Hanley Ramirez for me. <laughs> Will Smith got 14% finishing in third. Um, Mookie Betts got fourth with six and a half percent. And I guess Trey Turner left a sour taste in people's mouth. Cause he got like 1% of the vote. Even though he finished the highest in a regular season MVP voting, but people didn't like what he did, I guess. That concludes the inaugural Incline Dodgers Awards. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Fun stuff. Can't wait to do it again next year. And the best way to help us out with that is to just vote. So when we have the survey out a year from now, just participate. It's really easy and you'll have fun. Last thing I wanted to cover real quick, and then if you guys wanted to talk about anything else uh, that we didn't cover or anything random in general, feel free to do it. Yasiel Pui, haven't said his name in a while, came up in the news today and yesterday and all that because he found a new team finally. That's right, Yasiel Pui is signing in the KBO League. He's going to the Kiwoom Heroes on a $1 million deal. Uh, not too much to comment here other than it seems like he's been blackballed for Major League Baseball. The, the circumstances kind of explain itself. I know there's a lot of Dodgers fans out there that still want Yasiel Puig to return to a Dodgers. Uh, I hate to be the negative guy, but I don't think it would ever work out, nor do I want to see Yasiel Puig ever wear a Dodgers uniform again. I just don't think he's the right cultural fit, but we'll see what Yasiel Puig can do in Korea because this is definitely a change had a nice stint in Mexico over the last year. Had like an OPS around 900. Didn't really hit for power, though. Had like 10 home runs. I feel like everybody's going to fucking Korea right now. I mean, you can't really go to the major leagues right now because there are no major leagues, but it's like the seventh guy we've talked about going to Korea. Good for him. I mean, he could be, yeah. you know, the MVP of that league. No problem, in my opinion. I think uh, the one thing I'll say about Yasiel Puig is that I, I don't, I agree with Kevin. I don't see him ever coming back to the Dodgers. I just don't think that the Dodgers are going to want to take another gamble on someone because it didn't work out so well uh, last season. You want to talk about a guy that went from, looked like he was going to be a superstar to just falling off the planet. It's got to be Yasiel Puig for this last 10 year span. I mean, 2013, Arguably was an all-star. I know he just missed the cut because a lot of people felt he didn't play enough games. 2014 was an all-star. Uh, I think he was somewhere up there in the MVP voting somewhere, I think. And then after that, he just, he, I know the hamstring injuries held him back. Then there was some personal problems. They sent him to the minor leagues. Then he kind of rebounded in 2017 and 2018, had some iconic postseason moments, but it didn't matter. He got traded following the 2018 season and he played one more year and he hasn't been an MLB ever since. It happens. Anything else, guys? Any, anything you wanted to cover? Any rants? Anything I am you want to still, promote? I'm still excited for the 2022 season in the Los Angeles Dodgers, because I am still excited to see what they do with this roster. And even though there's a lockout, I don't think it's going to last forever. I do think we're going to get baseball back. And once we do, that's going to be a fun day because I feel like a lot of free agents are going to get signed really quickly. Yeah. I, I, my guess for the end of the lockout would be beginning to middle of February. I think this is going to be a, a you know, a couple months of this. All right. But we'll see. I, I, I think it's a good time during the lockout to bring back our out of left field segment for the next episode. Cause I've, we haven't done that in a long time and I've got plenty of things to yell about. We've, just oh, had, we too know. Much, we've had too much content. Yep. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to drop real quick? Uh, no, I'll save it. Okay. I'll save it. I got, I got plenty of stuff, but who knows if this lockout's going to be a couple months, that's quite a, quite a lot of out of left field. So space it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think we might need to go down the nostalgia train and start talking about former Dodgers or former seasons and just giving quick analysis on some takeaways. I know last night Jake was talking about the 2010 or 2011 season. Oh, <laughs> brutal. I mean, aside from individual performances, those teams were rough. Yeah, 
And then I posted a, a tweet about Zach Granke like two days ago and I actually got a lot of reception. A lot of people missed the Grank train. Same with Matt, your tweet about Manny too. That's yeah. Manny would. Those were the days. We could get into a little hall of fame discussion too. Oh, we point. will. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely oh yeah. That's that good. Up. That's good. I think the voting for the hall of fame is in January. Yeah. The ballots are already starting to trickle in. Yes. We Barry might Bonds is last year, I think. Yes. Maybe we'll cover that next week on the incline Dodgers with that. Help us out. Subscribe to the Incline Dodgers wherever you get your podcast. Give us a five star rating and drop a review if you like our content. We love, we need it, and we love you guys. So thank you for supporting us. We enjoy doing this. And yes, follow us on Twitter. Our handles and all that is in the description below. And yes, that's it for this week. Despite a lockout, we gave you over an hour of content. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. But with that being said, You'll hear from us next week. So go Dodgers.